Thanks very much, Kate, for that lovely introduction. And hi, everyone. It's nice to be, I know it's still virtual, but it's nice to be speaking to, um, to people in the Caribbean Studies Network. That's important for me. And I'll explain a bit about both my excitement and, res and reservations or nerves around, around presenting to people who study the Caribbean. Um, but yeah, it, for the questions, I would say uh, when it comes to that, because that will be most of our discussion, for those who are brave enough and willing, I'd love to see faces and hear voices, um, if at all possible. I realise some people have various reasons why they might not be able to do that. But if, if you feel up to it, that would be nice from my end. OK. So apologies for maybe being a little bit frazzled. It's the first term teaching on our new MA, so I haven't had as much time to prepare this as I would have liked. But what I want to do is give you an overview of the book and um, some of the important questions that are raised but not answered by it in relation to contemporary Jamaica and the Caribbean um, and really hear thoughts and comments uh, from you about about that aspect of the book and it, it you know it shouldn't take that much preparation because the years of preparation that go into a book should hopefully have hopefully mean that I know what I'm talking about <laughs> in terms of what I did myself and um, so here it goes so the book Deporting Black Britons I thought I'd start by just explaining what I did for the research. And this is my PhD um, thesis turned into a book. And so back in 2015, I decided to do a project on the experiences of people deported from the UK to Jamaica. So I flew to Jamaica. This is the first time I'd ever been um, to, uh, to Jamaica, to the Caribbean. I'd arranged to be an intern, um, which really just meant volunteering and accompanying uh, the organisation, which was called the National Organisation of Deported Migrants, which is not really operational anymore, but at the time had been set up by some deported migrants themselves um, with some funding from the British government um, and a lot of volunteer work to try and help people who'd been returned back and we can talk about the politics of the British funding for the organization a bit later on but there's a professor there was a professor who's uh, passed away in the last few years Bernard Headley who worked on crime and sociology in the North American context but was Jamaican and, and, and moved back there uh, who, who set up the organization with a few um, men who'd spent some time in the U.S. prison system before being uh, deported to Jamaica so there's this organization there got in touch with them and began working with them and through them, particularly through my relationship with one individual who I write about a little bit in the book, but who I'm greatly indebt indebted to, Ozzy, um, was introduced to people, would accompany him while he was getting about Kingston, um, would, uh, you know, was facilitated to meet a few people, was able to call a few people, uh, all of whom had been deported from the UK to Jamaica in the last few years. Um, and I basically just said, would you like to talk to me about your experiences, about your deportation stories, about your lives back in the UK? Um, and, you know, fortunately for me, quite a lot of people agreed and seemed quite keen to tell their stories. Unsurprising, given that they'd been disappeared in a way from the British context. And then, you know, some people decided I sounded all right and thought maybe they did want to speak to someone from the UK about the wrongs that had been done to them. So I got to know a few people very well kept going back to Jamaica between 2015 and 2019 for you know month, a couple of months at a time and also met people's friends and families back here in the UK so people's families in the UK in, in London sorry in in, um, in Glasgow in Manchester in Nottingham in Birmingham and hung out with them as well and tried to piece together life stories of people who'd been um, deported from the UK to Jamaica uh, kind of trying to patch together life stories that were defined by rupture and absence and separation and these are people I should say who I came to focus on in the book um, the book really focuses primarily on four individuals who um, some of whom have pseudonyms some of whom don't but that's Jason, Ricardo, Chris and Nico and each chapter is a kind of individual life story portrait but also one in which I tried to make several arguments about racism and immigration control um, really the broad questions are why were people deported, how 
and what did they have to say about the ways in which they were criminalized? When were they illegalized and why? And how did immigration controls come into their life course and their family and their family lives at different points? Uh, and questions about family work, crime, prison, detention, and the deportation flight, and obviously how people adjust and survive once they're returned, or rather, maybe we'd rather think about it as an arrival rather than a return um, in Jamaica, a place where for each of these four individuals, they hadn't been since they were teenagers. My focus was specifically on people who'd moved to the UK as children, and all of them had spent about half their lives in the UK before being deported. So arrived between 10 and 15, deported between 25 and 30. Um, that was my focus. The reason I came to it, it should, it's important to emphasize here, was not via an interest in the Caribbean, but rather via an interest in the politics of race and migration in the UK, and then the Caribbean becoming, you know, Jamaica in particular, it's not the Caribbean in, in any general sense. Um, Jamaica becoming the case study, the way to look, to work through these questions and these problems and these experiences. So firstly, I was interested in the problem of, of foreign criminals, um, a specific group within UK immigration policy and discourse that have increasingly been prioritized and drives to detain and deport and, and, and uh, identify the kind of ultimate baddies in the, in the migration story. And those people who have not got British citizenship they may have their status, they may have different kinds of status, but whose criminality, whose conviction for criminal, for criminal offences leads to them losing those rights of residence and then to facing deportation. This raises interesting questions about the connections between immigration control and racism in the criminal justice system, which are especially marked, obviously, with Black Britons and with Jamaican, Caribbean. Um, there are particular histories to ideas about crime and disorder in relation to Black people, African Caribbeans in the in the British context, as as we probably all know, and broad, more broadly, I was interested in the link between racism and borders, partly because these literatures and the organisations that work on issues of migration and race and racism tend to speak in silos, um, and not it's not clear to me that most people know what to say about the relationship between racism and immigration control. Are immigration controls racist? What would that mean? What's the connection between the two things? This raises questions about nationalism, about sovereignty, um, and about increasingly non-color-coded forms of uh, exclusion, which seem always to still have the mark of, of racism. Um, and just to speed through the kind of other things that are interesting about this from, from the project's inception, uh, the, the figure of the foreign criminal is important because it raises questions about the limited politics of deservingness or victimhood or contribution, which are usually so central to claims made for migrants. And I should say that I started this project before Brexit, before the vote to leave, at least back in 2015 and before the Windrush scandal. So things have clearly um, been propelled to centre stage since, since then. Now, we should note that after the Windrush scandal when, uh, and the pandemic um, in the period since the Windrush scandal in 2018, and, and of course, since the pandemic, uh, we've seen a massive reduction in enforced removals, especially to Jamaica, that is deportations or expulsions. Um, and the only, the only planes that have gone really have been charter flights, much contested on the ground by the migrant sector, by anti-racist activists but always justified by the Home Secretaries um, as the fact that these flights are separate to the Windrush scandal because everyone on the flight is a dangerous foreign criminal. So in a way, um, my focus has kind of become more and more prevalent in the very mainstream of debates about, about migration control in all of our news cycles, not just those who are thinking about who's in detention and who's being deported. Suddenly you have everyone talking about the Windrush scandal, everyone questioning whether deportations are fair or legal, and um, the only justification when the Home Office does want to resume those charter flights, in particular flights that are chartered just for, deport, for, for mass deportations, they justify that by saying this, these people are the opposite to the deserving Windrush migrants, these are dangerous foreign criminals. Okay, so that focus came first, we can think about all of the questions that raises about British politics, and we can talk about some of that in the in the comments, in, in the discussion after, if people want, but um, 
but yeah, I suppose beyond to, to, to kind of make a bridge between the question of Caribbean studies in the UK, one of the things I hope the book does, and one of the things I imagine the book is doing, one of the opening questions for me was, when it comes to Caribbean migration and settlement in the UK context, so when it comes to the place of people who are either from the Caribbean or who whose families come from the Caribbean, where are we? What What is this moment? What is this historical moment in terms of um, what has been written about since the post-war years as Black Britain or Caribbean Britain? Um, and I think that we, we have a particular kind of story that we tell about subsequent generations. So the first generation of people who moved after the war, you know, after the war, particularly heralded by the arrival of the SS Windrush, um, are defined as the kind of Windrush generation, the migrant generation. Uh, of course, m not migrants, British subjects, but still, we we tend to know that story somewhat, and the Windrush scandal blurs that by by making a new um, a generation of Windrush migrants who arrived before seventy three, whereas a lot of people would have said it was forty eight to sixty two that defined the Windrush generation, the point where migration was um, free before beat the band kinds of migration in sixty two, when um, when restrictions were first introduced. But then people talk about the kind of second generation, the rebel generation, the people who weren't willing to put up with the kinds of racist exclusions that their parents um, became used to, uh, the people who felt that they were born in Britain and so should have the same rights as anyone else, the people who lived through um, the crises in the 70s and then Thatcher, um, and this generation, you know, kind of defined by the uprisings or riots in 81 and 85, by a whole series of new black British music and culture. Um, and then the question for me, I mean, these are all shorthands and we should complicate all of them, but I still think it's interesting to think about what comes after, what's the generation uh, subsequent to the generation that lived through the eighties. And I think no one has a clear answer. If it becomes harder to, to reduce that to one kind of, um, to one kind of, motif or one one clear trope about what about the generation that comes next this partly because primary migration gets cut um you know there's a lot less people moving from the caribbean uh because of you know subsequent removal of rights change changes to nationality and immigration law uh just even a cursory look at the census for example will tell us that caribbean black caribbeans are less dominant within the populations who might be identified as Black British. So, you know, there are more people in the UK born in Nigeria, who were born in Nigeria than were born in Jamaica. Um, there's also a kind of geographical spread out of places where we might have associated with African Caribbean life in the UK. Um, so, so a geographical spread and, and then lots of children of the fourth and fifth generations of mixed heritage, for example, for whom the connections to the Caribbean might be increasingly distant. But one of the things that these life stories do of these, these um, guys in, in my book is to complicate that picture slightly by reminding everyone that this um, move from Windrush to rebel generation to, to then, you know, being Black British in, in more complex ways um, isn't linear. People did keep moving uh, from the Caribbean, even if in fewer numbers. And so the picture looks slightly different when we think about those who have not been born in the UK, but who have continued to move, especially those who moved as children. Uh, and I suppose I'm charting the ways in which people have kept moving, but they have been illegalized in new ways. We can talk about why I opt for the word illegalized in the discussion. Um, but lots of people moving, and a lot, most of the people in my project moving uh, in the late 90s and early noughties, before visa restrictions were brought in against Jamaicans in 2003, overstaying visitor visas, able to go to school, able to participate as citizens would because children, and then finding immigration restrictions a problem later, or regularizing stay later. And many people have done that and now live perfectly happily in the UK or as happily as anyone else can live in this particular place at this particular time. Um, but in this way, what, what I suppose the story does is bring us to the 21st century in terms of thinking about the place of uh, people from the Caribbean in the UK and Jamaicans in the UK, and saying that the racist resentments which we chart in the story about post-war migration, settlement, um, racism, resistance, those stories that are so familiar to people who 
I think about um, you know, multicultural Britain or who think about racism and resistance in Britain, uh, who think about histories of policing or who think about histories of uh, anti-immigration politics or really who want to chart the post-war history of the UK in any way, you obviously need to tell the story of um, Commonwealth uh, and former colonial migration and the responses to that. So the, the struggles over settlement and also the resentments from um, a beleaguered, increasingly anti-immigrant population, the desires and the campaigns to keep Britain white, to gain control, to stop the floods, to change the nationality law, um, to change, to re add increasingly restrictive immigration controls, to gain hold on cities which were seen to becoming spaces of disorder, panics about mugging and crime. All of these, um, all of this is now playing out centrally at the border. That's the argument. So the racist resentments don't, um, th those racist resentments might go into kind of law and order politics and they might go into increasingly violent rhetoric, but they also go into driving the UK's anti-immigrant policies, the, the hostile environment, new labours, calls to detain and deport more and more people, the anti-asylum politics. We have to see uh, anti-EU migration kind of narratives. You have to see that all as layering on top of a set of common sense arguments, fears, resentments, which were fundamentally, um, you know, laid and consolidated in the time, in the times around post-war migration. So that's, a, that's kind of an obvious point. But I suppose when you think about an individual who's been illegalized, who's now facing deportation, who's been separated from their children and their parents, um, this is in some ways, and then the struggles against that, the struggles among of those fighting for migrant rights, of those trying to think about different ways of dealing with um, criminal punishment, those uh, people campaigning, shouting outside the Home Office for the charter flights not to go and for the detention centres to be closed. Those struggles are precisely um, have ancestors in the anti-racist struggles and the racist resentments that we have maybe find more um, familiar when we think about Black Britain or about post-war migration in relation to um, the post-war years. So the book speaks to all of that. Um, and as I said, the reason why I might be a bit both excited and a bit nervous about presenting to those interested in Caribbean studies is that I think its contribution as a book is, is much more solid, much more substantive within a set of debates that I circulate around um, and have done for some time with regards to racism and migration in Britain. And so I would say, and one of the reviews of this book by someone writing from UE in Jamaica was, was right to pick this up, that I'm probably too broad brush with, with the account of Jamaica. Um, it's probably too general. And in a way, the writing about Jamaica becomes less a contribution to literature on Jamaica and the contemporary Jamaica and probably more um, a way of helping us understand um, the experience specifically of deportees and, and a way to critique the UK border from the perspective of what comes next, of what happens after. Um, but I do want to offer some comments here on what I learned from spending time in Jamaica with deported people. And the last two chapters in the book that, that um, come before the conclusion of, I attempt to think from Jamaica about big questions like citizenship and borders um, and deportation. So I'm specifically speaking to critical border studies, not enough to Caribbean studies, but I still think there's some things that are relevant for uh, all of us trying to make sense of this specific, uh, this particular region. So, Um, one thing I suppose is the place of the uh, deportee in, in Jamaican society and deportee I put scare quotes around because some of the deported people I came to know uh, had avoided that term, had not liked that term, felt that like it was inherently a stigmatizing term um, and so I, so I use scare quotes and, and there has been some literature on the ways in which deport, uh, deportees are stigmatized in Jamaica, subject to you know, exclusion from families. And I did find this, you know, I found cases of people being chucked out by estranged family members, people going up to job interviews and 
no one understands where they've been all this time and can tell quite clearly from their accent and their whole body comportment that they're not that they're not really Jamaican anymore in their eyes. Um, so so that that is a finding, you know, that that people are socially isolated, culturally alienated, that they're stigmatized, that as a, that you could see them as a particular social group who face particular hardships. But that felt like other other uh, research had found that as an issue, and I and I wanted to complicate it somewhat that. That to say that things weren't all miserable and that things change over time and that people do make connections and that this was an important part of studying people, you know, hanging out with people over, over four years. So we should also say that, you know, the number of people who were deported to Jamaica in the last 30 years, I mean, I think I come up with an estimate in, in the book, um, but just the numbers who've been deported from North America, Canada, the US and the UK um, since 1996, for example, reaches... Uh, hundreds of thousands so you're looking at um you're looking at when i say hundreds of thousands it's probably only a couple of hundred thousand but you're looking at a significant proportion of the population some estimate about um three percent um in fact hundred thousands is too many either way i think it was i think it's about three percent of the population and when you think about then men between the ages who are the vast majority of those deported between the ages of 30 or 25 uh, and 60 and you think about those that live in particular neighborhoods particular parts of, of town um, with in particular class positions you're actually looking at most people in urban neighborhoods in places like Rockford or Trenchtown or Denham Town or places in Mo Bay or places in Ochi will be able to identify a handful of people who spent time abroad and who either are well known as people who've been deported or it's kind of obvious that that's the reason they came back because why else would they have come back with very little so the, the population of deported people is not necessarily a discrete group that's defined only by abjection, but uh, one that can be incorporated in different ways and for whom deportation is an important part of life, but it's not the end and it's not all, uh, all abjection and suffering. And even though if you walk around Kingston, uh, particularly around Duke Street, you can hear the accents of some of the street homeless uh, populations, which are clearly American people with strong American accents and you will you will definitely notice that and people will often say that many of the people who are homeless on the streets are people who've been deported so we shouldn't lessen that but it looks quite different it, it would be uh it would be wrong to then say that deportation uh to, to imagine these as the typical deported populations that there, there's a kind of continuum of different experiences and so the book tries to say that carefully um and so therefore i tried to situate you know, de deportees within a larger frame um, and to think about how deported people might be uh, restricted in their mobility. They might be forced to stay on the island and unable to leave. They might have family abroad, you know, immediate family, and they might have spent a significant amount of time elsewhere. But perhaps we can think about Jamaican citizenship in general as defined by frustrated mobilities and Jamaican society as characterized by, un by heavily uneven mobilities, and always has been, of course. So then mobility, following the work of people like Mimi Shella, who focuses on the Caribbean, becomes a frame with which for me to describe and analyze Jamaica. So who gets to move and how and what meanings are attached to that movement um, are all important for, for thinking about studies of the Caribbean and studies of Jamaica, and deported people then become one group or one set of individuals in this cast of characters for whom um, movement is restricted and defined by a sense of frustration and injustice but also um, those circumstances change over time and some people who are deported do move do leave find ways to leave whether back to the UK or elsewhere um, and so we might think then of de deported people as a group whose stigma comes partly from being moved against their will uh, and that being a subject or an object of movement might be a useful frame for several characters uh, in the Jamaican context. And here, you know, then in the book briefly, I think about this, but I'd like to think about it more, is when we think about Jamaicans as not necessarily in, in agents of their own movement or not autonomous in their own movement, we might think about the tourist sector, of course, 
the uneven mobilities that make up the tourist sector, the people who, the, the consumers and the tourists who move in and the locals who serve. We might think about um, those who work in call centers, in outsourced call centers that provide for the US market in particular. And I think scamming is particularly interesting here. We can talk about that in the discussion as a, as a, as a way in which people have um, used those structures, uh, those businesses, and then created kind of illicit enterprises, which are now subject of great concern. Um, these are people who take the phone numbers and deal in the phone numbers of, of people in the US context and call very much with a similar kind of script, um, scamming people out of money effectively. Um, we might also think about how people's mobilities are restricted in the cities. And here I'm thinking of zones of special operations, which I'm particularly interested in at the moment, the ways in which the police and the military work together to create particular zones where, where crime and um, homicides are especially high and uh, create kind of cordons and curfews, the logics that define them, the particular um, ways in which those operations work, what it feels like to be in those, in those zones. And to think about other kinds of zones like the economic zones, which is where, uh, you know, export processing zones or free zones, which is where a lot of these call centers are. So there's a question of um, zones and who gets zoned in particular ways. And more broadly, it's not only deported people who experience citizenship as an imposed or as an ascribed or assigned legal status, which is lived as a kind of form of containment on the island in a particular place in the world. So citizenship, not as solely a kind of uh, source of political subjectivity or a relationship between an individual state and its citizens, but a kind of um, assignment in the world, a passport which assigns to which state you belong and therefore where you have to be. And uh, of course, deport deportees experience this in the sharpest form because they're returned home. This is what makes deportation a historically specific form of expulsion, they're returned home and the, 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 the deportation is arranged between two states, the deporting state and the receiving state of, of um, to which the individual belongs in legal terms. Um, so, so that really draws attention to citizenship as a kind of um, what Barry Hindus calls um, a regime for the international management of population. But I think again, if we're trying to, rather than isolate the experiences of deportees as an individual, group that experience things that others don't, if we think about their connectedness to others where they arrive, then this experience of citizenship as being assigned a space legally and spatially in the world um, is useful, I think, for a much wider group of people. And then the second big major point, and I'll try and, I'll try and round off here because I think I've had my half an hour, but I, I um, also found that that the big point worth thinking about in relation to Jamaica was the bilateral and di diplomatic relations between the British and the Jamaican government. And this is what I mean about deportation being a specific form of expulsion, which relies on arrangements between states. So while it's easy to imagine deportation in terms of the life stories as before the life of a person here in the UK, the, the brutality of the detention and the flight, and then after, how do people survive post deportation? What does it mean to live in Jamaica? What can be missed there is what happens between, uh, between and between governments, the negotiations. Um, and here, I suppose one of the things that I discovered was that the UK um, was funding so-called reintegration services, like the National Organization of Deported Migrants, like homeless shelters in, the, in, in Kingston and in Montego Bay, um, as part of a wider package for the reintegration and rehabilitation of deported migrants and um, offenders in Jamaica. Uh, and we're funding through this, this program, uh, the Passport Authority to modernize the systems of national identification, um, the Ministry of National Security in general, and trying to secure deals on prison transfer agreements so that people could be deported uh, or transferred before being deported from prison. People may remember David Cameron's announcement of a prison deal. And of course, the UK's longer history of trying to train the police and the Coast Guard, etc. Much of this, you know, through the aid budget. So that 
the um, the organizations which quite literally pick people up from the airport, the National Organization of Deported Migrants, and drive them to the homeless shelter, both of these services being funded through the UK's aid budget. Um, so the UK, um, so the individual who's deported arrives back, is collected by a local NGO and taken to a local homeless shelter, both of which are funded by the British government um, through the aid budget and both of which are listed often in Home Office decision letters saying, well, I know you might not have any family uh, in Jamaica. I know you may have been in the UK since you were two years old. We accept that. But you're young and healthy and you'll, you'll find your way. And there's a public interest in your deportation. And also, by the way, there's these local services. This, these ones will help you clear your items through customs. This one will try and help you find accommodation. There's homeless shelter, so you won't be out on the streets and you won't be abandoned at the airport, et cetera. So, um we can kind of see this in terms of the um attempts to control unruly mobilities of people um and and kind of think about how deportation is embedded within wider foreign policy agendas in general um and here think about you know the eu and the funding of various african governments to kind of increase state capacity in so-called source and transit countries where development increasingly looks like securitization and bordering. And so this Jamaican example is only one in a much wider architecture of uh, European and, and as well as UK funding for um, governments that are encouraged to prevent migrants moving and to, you know, to take them back. Um, and I suppose I'll just end now by saying that I'm interested in broadening this frame out from, from deportees in particular and thinking about the ways in which various forms of control on people's mobility in Jamaica um, is driven by external interests, by donor governments and international organizations. And here, I'll just leave you with the fact that the Jamaica is just past the National Identification System Bill, which will create a digital identification system. And I wanna think about who is funding that and why and what the kind of logics are behind giving everyone a personal digital identity. And also think about the tourist sector, which is, of course, so important to Jamaica's economy and the ways in which particular mobility is being governed as Jamaica uh, you know, creates tourism, COVID-19 resilient corridors, where there's a new kind of way of mapping the country so that tourists can arrive without needing to quarantine so long as they stay in the particular strip around the North Coast. Um, and that last bit's a bit rushed, but I think I'll leave it there because I've been, been going on for 35 minutes.